Solution, and we are now officially in the after show. And we're so grateful that Dr. Therese Ken- uh, Kennedy decided to join us here on the after show. And I believe, Naima, you asked him a question. And for the callers on the line, don't worry, we will get to you. Just be sure you just keep that hand up there. Um, um, yes, you were going to tell us some of the things that the, the Black Panthers did uh, culturally or, or addressing our cultural need to. Uh, repair some of our self-esteem issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. So uh, I think that one big thing was that they had the Black Panther News Service. So, of course, we're all familiar with the uh, final call, but the Black Panther newspaper at its peak, they would print it in Oakland and ship it all over the country. Oh, they were they had a circulation of 300,000 papers a wow. week. Wow. Which was a huge number back in that time. Sure was. That's a huge number now. Right. Wow. They were too powerful. They were gaining too much yeah. power. People were listening. They were awakening yeah. minds. The yeah. powers that be don't want that. Yes. Yeah. So they had a lot of uh, provocative uh, articles in the paper and the. Uh, one of the brothers, I can't remember his name right now, who was an uh, artist, you know, he did a lot of great visual cartoon stuff that would connect with the young people. And also the Panthers founded their own community school for about 10 years. Ooh. And I believe yeah, I remember they, that. they were educating like maybe 150, 200 black children at a time. Mm-hmm. So they were also on the cutting edge as it relates to education. Mm. Well, I know about the school. Yeah. Yes, and I'm sure they probably influenced uh, Haki Manabuti, who uh, he and his wife and the staff of people founded uh, Black what is now Beni Shabazz International Charter School, and a lot of the, I guess, rituals and things and principles and, and teachings were influenced by that era of the Black Panthers. And kids, kids can't learn if they're hungry, so the free breakfast program, that before before Title I programs and before the schools started feeding and before Meals on Wheels, mm. uh, the Panthers were feeding people. Mm-hmm. I remember I remember seeing all that. Uh, Baba Kwame, some horse you wanted to chime in? Yeah, he spoke to that. I was talking about the, the free breakfast program because that was one of the big things that Fred Hampton was, was very instrumental and the, what we call now the Rainbow Coalition. Jesse Jackson yes. had started. That yes. was started by Fred Hampton and joining yes. the rednecks on the north side and the Hispanics and creating the Rainbow Coalition. You know, the Panther Party in itself took its name from, from another organization because they were first us. Well, they were, were Malana Karinga and 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 Hampton and Bobby C. I mean, not Fred Hampton, uh, Huey P. Newton, and they in turn split, and us took over. Malana took the the us organization, and then they started the Panther Party, and they took the symbol from a group in Alabama and and used that symbol as the Panther to start the Panther organization. These are the parts that the missing pages of, of world history is, is the missing pages of our history. There's a great book on, on the elder, the Panthers. It's called the Panthers by Brian Shy S H I H and you Williams and the Vanguard by Ruth Marion. And these are the, the books that have been put out by us to tell the story of, of from these original people who were part of the party. And we have to stop taking these half-truths because it's a whole lie. Ooh. And part of it is is that we have to begin to understand our story, not his story. That's why I said his story, his criminalization of us through his putting out the stories that are not the, the whole truth. Because I just sent you a, a, a clip that I did in a PowerPoint presentation, mm-hmm. the Wood Wide Web. And that's why I was talking about nature. The first internet was the trees. And we were uprooted from the continent, as, as Naima talks about in her book. We were uprooted and, and planted here. 
And this is what we're doing is that we're looking at generations that have been planted into a soil and, and to, to the earth and have been made to believe in that which is not their true nature of who they are. Mm, mm. So, yeah, that, that means we have to do some reteaching. So I'm very glad to know that the Panthers started the school. And these are some of the things, uh, like you were mentioning about Kwame, that people did coming out of slavery, starting schools and universities. It's just, okay, we need a school. Oh, we don't know how to read. Oh, let's, let's start a school. I mean, there was no thought of, oh, we can't do that. We don't have I, money. I, oh, let's just do it. Yeah, right. So that's definitely I what have. happened. I have my great grandmother's teaching certificate right now from when she went to Rush was one of the second started HBCUs in, in America was Rush College there in Holly Springs, Mississippi. That's the home of Ida B. Wells where she was born at. But Rush College and I have her teaching certificates from nineteen oh eight because she taught in a colored school. Most wow. of our education was done in colored schools, not after they got into the education, but we started in colored schools, and then we went to their universities to get certifications or get degrees and validation from them. But we started with us because we started, and and my hometown is in Aberdeen, and across the highway is Egypt, and they used to bring the Egypt, Mississippi. They used to bring the children in a wagon, and they would stay with families in order for the kids to get an education. Because wow. they they had to walk too far. That was busing. Mm. We were wagoning our children to get an education. 